slides. Yes, we can see the slides. So um, I'm requesting if you can do it as um, a slideshow. Yeah, let me do that. There, are you able to see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Anne Kabuti. I'm uh, currently pursuing uh, my master's in internal medicine, University of Nairobi. Today, I'll take you through this talk on management of uh, H. pylori. I would want to thank the KNH research team for the invitation to present this uh, talk. So this will be the outline of the presentation. We'll discuss a bit on the microbiology of uh, H. pylori. We'll go over the pathogenesis of H. pylori. We'll discuss about the epidemiology, the risk factors, the mode of transmission, how a diagnosis of H. Uh, pylori is made. And finally, we'll discuss uh, on the treatment of H. pylori. So as part of the introduction, uh, H. pylori um, is a spiral-shaped uh, microaerophilic bacteria. And uh, when I mean microaerophilic, uh, I mean that uh, this bacteria requires oxygen to thrive, but at lower concentrations uh, than that in the environment. In the environment, we have about 21% oxygen. This bacteria requires about uh, 2 to 10 percent oxygen concentration to grow. It's also gram negative and it measures approximately 3.5 microns in length and 0.5 microns in width. Now H. pylori possesses two to six uh, sheath uh, flagella at one polar end and these allow it to move throughout the mucus layer to the gastric epithelium layer. Biochemically, uh, H. pylori produces oxidase, uh, catalase, and uh, urease uh, enzyme. And urease is vital for its uh, survival and colonization. So uh, for H. pylori to survive and uh, proliferate in the gastric milieu, uh, it produces uh, urease uh, enzyme and uh, it produces it in large amounts, up to more than 5%, uh, making up uh, up to more than 5% of its total uh, body weight. So this uh, urease, as I said earlier, is vital for its survival. And uh, it converts uh, the gastric luminal urea to form ammonium and carbon dioxide. And uh, this helps to neutralize the gastric acid in the stomach and also form a protective cloud around the organism, enabling it to penetrate the gastric uh, mucus layer. It's also uh, spiral shaped and uh, possesses two to six uh, sheath flagella and it also produces mucolytic enzymes. And this facilitates its passage from uh, through the mucus layer to the gastric uh, surface epithelium. It also expresses adhesins that facilitate its attachment to the gastric epithelium. So this slide, uh, this uh, diagram illustrates the pathogenesis briefly of uh, H. pylori. So upon entering the host uh, stomach, uh, H. pylori will produce urease. And uh, this urease will convert um, urea to ammonium and carbon dioxide, making it um, adapt to this acidic environment. What that does, um, the ammonium neutralizes the acid in, uh, in the mucus layer. Then we also have, uh, as I said earlier, it, have, it possesses flagella. As you can see, this one has four flagella. And these uh, flagella are at one uh, polar end, as we had said earlier. And this facilitates movement uh, uh, from this mucus layer all the way to the gastric uh, epithelium, to the gastric epithelium. 
So now upon reaching uh, this uh, gastric uh, epithelium, the H. pylori now will express what we call adhesins, and these adhesins will facilitate its attachment to this epithelium. And thereafter, upon uh, adhering to this uh, epithelium, it will produce uh, toxins that uh, damage the host. And this, uh, these toxins include uh, cytotoxin-associated gene A, which is uh, commonly known as the CAG A toxin, and also uh, a VAC A toxin, which is a vacuolating cytotoxin. And this damage host uh, tissues leading to chronic inflammation. So in, uh, in terms of the epidemiology of uh, H. pylori, uh, this bacteria affects 50% uh, of the world's population. In a meta-analysis, uh, in a, a meta-analysis, um, in a systematic review and meta-analysis done by Hui et al., uh, he estimated the global prevalence of uh, H. pylori at uh, 4.4 billion people in the year 2015. And uh, prevalence remains high in developing countries. And in this meta-analysis, he found um, the highest, pre uh, highest prevalence in Africa, and this was estimated at 70.1%. In Africa, the pre uh, highest prevalence was noted in Nigeria at 87.7%, and it was lowest in Egypt at 40.9%. So H. Uh, pylori both uh, affects both males and females equally. There is no sex uh, predilection. The infection is acquired uh, most frequently during childhood. And uh, children and females have a higher incidence of uh, reinfection, up to 8% uh, more than the adult males. And the prevalence in adults peaks up to more than 80% before the age of 50 years, uh, meaning that H. Uh, pylori is more prevalent in a younger population. And it is more common in Blacks and Hispanics compared to the white population. And this has been attributed uh, partly due to uh, low socioeconomic uh, status. So uh, what's uh, the prevalence in Kenya? So there are various studies that have been done. And uh, Lule et al. And, uh, found a prevalence of 90%. Uh, well, Ogutu et al. found a prevalence of 100% in uh, both uh, studies done in patients with peptic ulcer disease at Kenyatta National Hospital. Now, Luai Lume et al. in the year 2005 found a prevalence of 80% in patients with dyspepsia at Kenyatta National Hospital. Uh, Kimanga et al. Uh, at the Aga Khan University Hospital found a prevalence of 54.8%. This is in adults population in patients uh, with uh, dyspepsia. Uh, Churuai et al. found a prevalence of 53.2% in patients uh, with dyspepsia at uh, Moi Teaching and Referral Hospital in the year 2015. In the year 2015. So uh, what are the risk factors for acquiring uh, H. pylori? So the risk of acquiring H. pylori infection is related to socioeconomic uh, status and living con uh, conditions in early life. Now, low socioeconomic uh, status, over overcrowding, especially where we find large families and uh, where large families crowded in a small household, and probably uh, sharing beds uh, 
together now this with poor sanitary conditions, lack of learning, uh, running water, and low levels of edu uh, education uh, have been associated with a higher risk of acquiring H. pylori infection. There is no uh, hereditary susceptibility to H. pylori that has so far been proven. And as we said earlier, Hispanics and the uh, Black uh, population uh, have a higher rate of infection uh, compared to the uh, Caucasians. And this has partly been attributed to a low socioeconomic uh, status. Um, consumption of salted uh, food has also been associated with uh, being a risk factor. And this has a uh, high salt has been shown to increase um, the colonization of uh, H. pylori. So uh, in terms of uh, transmission, the route of, uh, by which the infection occurs remains unknown and humans appear to be the major reservoir for the infection. So person to person transmission of uh, H. pylori uh, through fecal oral or oral, oral exposure seems uh, most likely. So, and uh, person to person, uh, there, there have been studies to, that support person to person transmission. In uh, one study done at uh, North uh, Car uh, Carolina showed that exposure to an infected uh, uh, household member with gastroenteritis was associated with an increased risk of up to uh, 4.8 uh, times for a definite and uh, or probable uh, new infection. And in this case, vomiting was the greatest uh, risk factor. Uh, we also find that uh, intraf uh, intrafamilial uh, clustering uh, also supports this person-to-person -person transmission, where infected individuals are more likely to have infected spouses and children and children than the uninfected individuals. So fecal oral transmission of the bacteria is also possible. And this uh, this is a mainly uh, through contaminated water supplies. And contaminated water has been shown um, to serve as an environmental source of the bacteria. This bacteria uh, can remain viable in water for, se uh, for several days. And children who regularly swim in uh, rivers, streams, and drink stream water or in eat uncooked vegetables are most likely to be infected. So, Oral oral transmission has not uh, yet uh, been uh, confirmed. We can also get a uh, iatrogenic infection, and this uh, has been documented following uh, use of uh, inadequately disinfected gastric devices, endoscopes, and uh, endoscopic accessories uh, during endoscopies. So H. pylori uh, has been implicated in causation of uh, various pathologies. As we all know, H. pylori has been implicated in causation of acute and chronic uh, gastritis. This is a uh, following inflammation associated uh, gastric, uh, gastric mucosal injury. Uh, H. pylori has also been associated with causing peptic ulcer disease. As we all know, uh, H. pylori uh, is, uh, was classified as a carcinogen uh, by WHO and has been associated in causation of uh, gastric mucosal associated lymphoid uh, tissue lymphoma and also gastric uh, adenocarcinoma. So uh, for it to cause uh, these tumors, uh, H. pylori causes chronic inflammation of the gastric mucosa, leading to atrophic gastritis, 
and also intestinal metaplasia and a pre and formation of pre neoplastic lesions that eventually lead to formation of this uh, of the gastric adenocarcinoma. Now, uh, H. pylori strains that are uh, that pro uh, that produce a cytotoxin, cytotoxin associated gene A toxin are associated uh, with the causation of gastric uh, uh, lymph, uh, gastric mucosal um, associated lymphoid uh, tissue lymphoma. So H. pylori has uh, also been implicated in causation of iron deficiency anemia. In this case, uh, it will cause gastric atrophy and hypochlorhydria, leading to decreased uh, ion absorption. It, it's also been implicated in causation of vitamin B12 deficiency. Again, it will cause a uh, chronic uh, atrophic gastritis that uh, leading to hypochlorhydria and also vitamin B12 uh, malabsorption. Uh, H. pylori also produces uh, antibodies that cross-react uh, with a gastric uh, parietal hydrogen potassium ATPase. And this could also be a way of, uh, in which it causes vitamin B12 uh, deficiency. So, and also eradication of uh, H. pylori has been associated with an increase in vitamin B12 levels in patients who have had uh, uh, vitamin B12 uh, deficiency. So how is, uh, how do we make a diagnosis of uh, H. pylori? Diagnosis of uh, H. pylori can be made uh, using both invasive and non-invasive uh, tests. So for the non-invasive test, we have the urease uh, breath test. We also have the stool uh, antigen test. And uh, what we normally have at Kenyatta National Hospital is a stool uh, antigen test as an invasive, as a non-invasive test. So uh, we also have a invasive uh, test. And these are uh, the invasive tests are here being endoscopy. And once uh, biopsies are collected, these biopsies are uh, tested for H. pylori either using the rapid urease uh, test or using histology or using bacterial culture. So for the urease uh, breath test, uh, this is uh, based upon, uh, this test is based upon hydrolysis of urea by H. pylori to produce carbon dioxide and ammonia. So urea with a labeled uh, carbon isotope is given by mouth and the H. pylori uh, liberated labeled carbon dioxide can be detected in the bread samples. Uh, this test is uh, highly sensitive at 95% and specific at 95 to 100%. So, what is a uh, common, uh, what uh, most people know of and what is commonly used is uh, uh, stool, uh, the stool antigen assay. And this uh, test detects bacterial antigen in stool. And uh, when bacterial antigen uh, is detected in stool, this indicates an ongoing H. pylori infection. Now, stool antigen testing can uh, be used to either establish an initial diagnosis of H. pylori, or for those who have received treatment for H. pylori, it can be used to confirm eradication. It has a sensitivity of 94% and a specificity of 97%. So uh, this uh, test is affected by recent use of bismuth compounds, use of antibiotics, and also use of proton pump inhibitors. Therefore, when, pre uh, when ascending a patient for stool antigen assay, um, these are... Um, when sending a patient for a stool uh, antigen assay, you should make sure that this patient has not been on antibiotics for four weeks prior to the test. 
and has also not been on a proton pump inhibitors for two weeks prior to testing. So as I said, uh, we also have invasive tests and this is uh, mainly done uh, via endoscopy, OGD, what uh, most people commonly known as uh, OGD. And uh, OGD is performed uh, to diagnose H. pylori uh, related uh, pathologies. And it's also uh, done uh, to collect uh, biopsy specimens for the biopsy urease test for the histology test and also for culture, for culture test. So, so biopsy, ure, uh, biopsy urease test, uh, this is a rapid test that can be performed uh, immediately after collecting a biopsy. The test takes around 15 to 20 minutes. So what happens that a gastric biopsy specimen is placed in medium that contains a urea and a pH reagent. Remember we said H. pylori will produce a urease that will convert urea to ammonium and carbon dioxide. And now this, uh, produce, uh, this will produce an alkaline pH and result in a color change. And that's how you will know that uh, the patient has a uh, H. pylori. And there are rapid uh, urease uh, test kits available in the market, including Campylobacter like uh, organism uh, test, uh, commonly known as CLO test kits, uh, which is uh, most uh, widely used uh, worldwide. Uh, we also said you can collect uh, biopsies for histology. And uh, gastric uh, biopsies can uh, diagnose uh, H. pylori infections and uh, H. pylori infection and associated uh, lesions. Uh, an example of this being atrophic gastritis, intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and also mild lymphoma. Now for histology, special uh, stains are used. And in this case, you can use a modified GM stain or a immune histochemical stain. And it's a gold standard in making a primary diagnosis. It's uh, the sensitivity and specificity of uh, histology is uh, quite high at a 95% and at 98% respectively. So, uh, for, uh, for the biopsies, we can also do culture and sensitivity. And this has a high uh, specificity, but it has a low sensitivity since uh, H. pylori is difficult uh, to culture. But there are ways uh, in which you can increase uh, this uh, sensitivity. Uh, number one, uh, when sending a patient for bacterial culture and sensitivity, remember when you're going for endoscopy, these patients should not have been on antibiotics uh, four weeks prior to having the endoscopy, and also PPI is two weeks prior to the endoscopy, because this to inhibit the growth of uh, bacteria. Now, um, to increase the bacterial yield, uh, biopsies should be taken at uh, five sites, and this um, using the biopsy, uh, seed, uh, the five biopsy Sydney system, where these five sites include two biopsies taken from the antrum, one at the greater curvature, and the other the lesser curvature, two biopsies taken at the body, one at the gas, uh, gastric. Uh, uh, at the uh, greater curvature and the lesser curvature and one at the incisura, making a total of five biopsies. Uh, 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 two at the antrum, two at the body, and one at the incisura. Now, uh, once these biopsies are collected, they should be taken to the lab and uh, processed immediately within uh, six hours of uh, biopsy collection. And again, uh, the culture media used uh, for culture should be supplemented uh, with antimicrobial agents 
And this will inhibit uh, overgrowth of uh, contaminating bacteria and fungi. And that way, all those are uh, uh, increased, uh, will help you increase the yield of the bacteria cultured. So why eradicate uh, H. Uh, pylori? Why are we talking about H. pylori today? Um, Eradication uh, of uh, H. pylori has uh, been shown to have uh, benefits. And one of those is that a uh, cure, uh, cure uh, eradication of uh, H. pylori has been shown to cure and prevent a uh, recurrence of peptic ulcer disease. It has also been shown to reduce a uh, progression of uh, gastric uh, mucosal associated uh, lymphoid tissue lymphoma. Uh, uh, it's also been shown to cause regression of atrophic gastritis and to reduce uh, the risk of developing a gastric uh, adenocarcinoma. And those are the references down there. You can have a look at them uh, later. So in terms of uh, treatment, what are the goals of uh, treatment? The goals of pharmacotherapy are one, to eradicate the microorganism, as you have seen that has benefits, and two, to prevent uh, complications, and number three, to reduce uh, morbidity. In terms of uh, treatment involves a combination of uh, antimicrobial agents and uh, proton pump inhibitors. So uh, uh, the, choice of the, the choice of initial um, antibiotic regimen should be guided by the presence of uh, risk factors for macrolide uh, resistance. And the risk factors for macro, uh, macrolide resistance include prior, one includes a prior exposure to macrolide th uh, therapy for any reason. And the macrolides here include clarithromycin, uh, athithromycin, or um, uh, erythromycin. Um, this, uh, this, uh, this, ah, uh, yes. Mac uh, as I said, the macrolides here are erythromycin, athithromycin, and um, clarithromycin. Number two, uh, high local clarithromycin resistance rates of more than 15%, or eradication rates uh, with clarithromycin triple therapy of less than 85%. Now, Clarithromycin-based uh, 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 therapy should be avoided in patients with one or more of the risk factors for the uh, for resistance. One, as we have said, exposure to macro macrolide therapy for any reason, and two, uh, high uh, local clarithromycin resistance of more than fifteen percent. Meaning, you need to know the the local clarithromycin uh, resistance rates in uh, uh, the facility where one is uh, practicing. So uh, we did a local, uh, we did a study recently at uh, Kenyatta National Hospital and at the Nairobi Hospital. And uh, we were looking for, and in this study, uh, we, were, we did um, antimicrobial susceptibility testing of uh, H. pylori, and this was cultured in patients who had uh, dyspepsia. And we found a high overall uh, resistance rate of 81% and an overall uh, resistance rate of 13% to clarithromycin. At Kenyatta National Hospital, the clarithromycin resistance rate uh, we found was at 8%. And at the uh, Nairobi uh, Hospital, the clarithromycin resi resistance rate was at 18%. And why is this important? As I have said earlier, um, areas where clarithromycin uh, rates of more than 15% uh, means that, that clarithromycin should not be used in that uh, environment. Uh, as you can see, uh, 
it's still a relative it's still a good drug uh, we can use at our facility that is at knh the bacteria isolated uh, in the study were largely sensitive to le uh, levofloxacin amoxi amoxicillin and ciprofloxacin so uh, what uh, drugs are available for treatment of uh, uh, h pylori so first line therapy uh, the standard first line uh, therapy contains three drugs and this is a proton is a uh, first line triple therapy and contains a proton pump inhibitor clarithromycin uh, clarithromycin or metronidazole and amoxicillin for 14 days. Now, in areas with the clarithromycin resistance of 15%, and this is as per the Maastricht uh, five consensus report, Bismuth uh, containing a quadruple therapy should be used. And this uh, contains a PPI, Bismuth, uh, metronidazole, tetracycline for a duration of 14 days. You can also use a non-bismuth quadruple therapy, which contains a proton pump inhibitor, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and metronidazole for 14 days. So if uh, first, uh, first line treatment, or, or rather first line uh, therapy uh, can fail, and this uh, has been attributed to clarithrom uh, high clarithromycin resistance or the resistance to metronidazole. So when first line uh, when uh, when first line therapy fails, uh, it means uh, we we'll need to go to a second line uh, therapy. But before we discuss a second line therapy, let's discuss on. Uh, on areas with drug, uh, on uh, the first line uh, treatment for areas with drug, dual clarithromycin and metronidazole resistance. So, in areas with dual clarithromycin and metronidazole uh, resistance, this is clarithromycin of more than uh, fifteen percent. Uh, bismuth quadruple therapy is recommended. However, in this case, clarithromycin uh, should be avoided. So uh, drugs that should be used uh, include amoxicillin, uh, uh, furazolidone, tetracycline, and rifabutin. If uh, bismuth uh, in combination with bismuth, if bismuth is not available, a combination of uh, uh, levofloxacin, uh, rifabutin, amoxicillin, and high dose PPI can be used. As I said earlier, first line therapy can fail, and that means you'd have to go to second therapy. That is a first line triple therapy. And when that fails, um, what options do we have? Uh, you could use a quadruple uh, therapy. As I said, this one contains a PPI, bismuth, metronidazole, and tetracycline, or a levofloxacin-based triple therapy for 14 days. But remember, in our setup, we have a high, uh, metronidazole, high metronidazole resistance uh, rates. So uh, that should be avoided and would recommend uh, a levofloxacin uh, based uh, triple therapy uh, is recommended in this situation. And then uh, levofloxacin uh, based triple therapy here includes uh, levofloxacin, amoxicillin and a proton pump inhibitor. So now after you've done a uh, first line uh, treatment, it has failed. You've done a uh, second line uh, treatment and it has failed. So what is the next step? After a failure of second line uh, treatment, antimicrobial susceptibility testing after culture or molecular determination of a genotype resistance is recommended wherever possible. Um, uh, we don't have uh, the antimicrobial susceptibility test. Uh, uh, the test is not uh, usually done in Kenyatta and they're not uh, uh normal uh, they're not uh routinely the word is they're not uh routinely done but for patients uh 
But as you can see in the Maastricht uh, five uh, recommendation, anyone who fails uh, first line and uh, second uh, line treatment, this, uh, this should be, uh, or rather antimicrobial susceptibility testing uh, should be done. So uh, we also have uh, what we call a rescue or that line uh, therapy. And this, uh, this we have uh, two regimens that can be used. Uh, the first one is a bismuth uh, based uh, treatment and this contains a PPI, uh, bismuth, uh, bismuth tetracycline or amoxicillin, uh, furazolidone or tetracycline used for 14 days. Uh, furazo, uh, furazolidone is not uh, available. I think it's also not available in the country. So we can also use uh, levofloxacin based sequential therapy. Well, in this case, a PPI and amoxicillin for seven days is given. And this is followed by a PPI, metronidazole, uh, and levofloxacin for another uh, seven days. Uh, for another seven days. And that uh, marks the end of the presentation. Any questions are welcome. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kabuti, for that uh, very interesting um, presentation. And uh, we right, right now we know that a lot of our patients come to the hospital complaining of gastritis. So we'll get right into the questions. And there are several questions that have been asked. So there's a question from Lawrence Nzuki, who's asking, um, is the H. pylori exaggerated in Kenya or is it because of poor diagnosis? And I think the question here is, um, we've elaborated the prevalence of H. pylori, especially while well in the wards, but for now the general population, how is that um, prevalent? How is the prevalence of H. pylori in that case? Okay, uh, as I said uh, earlier, um, I, 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 I wouldn't say that, uh, that uh, it's, uh, it's exaggerated. Uh, remember, uh, H, uh, not everyone who gets uh, H. pylori develops uh, symptoms. The majority of our patients, almost 80% of the patients uh, who develop uh, H. pylori are asymptomatic. So that's number one. Number two, um, for us, uh, the prevalence studies we have seen have, have largely been done within uh, Nairobi and its environs, and uh, I would say the surrounding counties, because most of the patients, even if uh, they're, uh, they're coming to Kenyatta, majority are referred for probably endoscopies from the nearby uh, counties. So um, we, we, we've not had uh, like uh, large studies that uh, than countrywide to give us that uh, prevalence of uh, H. pylori uh, in the country. But what we know, it's um, uh, the prevalence is coming down. Initially, you noted that we had a prevalence of uh, 80%, uh, 80% and now coming down to around 50, 54%. Um, thank you very much for that. Um... There's, there's a question that um, from a lot of the participants in terms of patient compliance to the drug, and, and this spans from the cost of the drugs um, to the availability like of the second line drugs to whether the patient will actually be able to adhere um, up until the um, four weeks are done. So, um, what, like, what would you advise in such cases, especially through the, in, in the chain of accessibility to compliance of these drugs? Okay, so um, 
one of the challenges one of the challenges that we get um, with the management of uh, h pylori is resistance resistance could be driven by uh, what you would call non adherence non adherence to the drugs could also contribute to resistance so uh, in this uh, case uh, what I would advise a patient is that you see the first, the antibiotics you are doing them for a duration, it's not seven days, it's a duration of uh, 14 days. So any patient on treatment should be encouraged to at least complete the 14 days of uh, treatment because, and um, the reason why we say that uh, the patients need to complete uh, the 14 days of treatment is that we need to eradicate the bacteria from their system. Otherwise, uh, if it is not eradicated, it's going to cause uh, complications. And we have seen it uh, causes, uh, it's associated with grave compl uh, complications like gastric uh, adenocarcinoma. You can also get a uh, peptic ulcer disease. These patients could bleed from the ulcers. Yes. So I would recommend, um, I would encourage uh, us doctors for patients uh, who you prescribe uh, treatment, ensure them you cancel them on the complications of uh, of uh, H. pylori. And if that way, once patients are aware of the complications, most of them are going to adhere to completing the 14 days of uh, treatment. Now, the challenge of the cost, cost uh, finances, uh, I know finances uh, are an issue, and that is why we'll find uh, in some of the county hospitals, people are still using metronidazole for treatment of H. pylori. Uh, because in these uh, setups, uh, patients are not able to afford uh, uh, clarithromycin uh, due to uh, high cost. But as you have seen, we have so much uh, resistance to metronidazole. So in terms of uh, cost issues, I think would have to, uh, policies need to be made, or rather we need to talk to MOH and find out in which they can reduce the cost for clarithromycin, because we have um, high cost, of, uh, we have mark, uh, we have reported high resistance to metronidazole. Not forgetting that, um, these drugs that are used are not only used for H. pylori, they're not specific for H. pylori alone. So you can find uh, metronidazole used also for diarrheal diseases, uh, amoxicillin is used for pneumonias. So yes, that's how I would answer that question. Um, thank you very much um, for your response. And I can see a lot of the attendees are asking for access to the presentation and to the PowerPoints. Um, once we have um, approval from the speaker, Dr. Ann Kabudi, we'll be able to make um, the PowerPoint presentations available and the recording of this session will also be made available at the KNH website. So um, when you want to view it, just go to the KNH website and you can be able to see um, this presentation. Um, back to the question. So, a lot of the attendees are asking um, the criteria for H. pylori er eradication. And I guess it's something maybe you should um, revisit, Doc, um, because they're asking, so what, what is the criteria for H. pylori um, eradication? And um, once, once someone has completed their medication, um, Thomas has noted that most of the patients return with recurring symptoms. Um, does it mean once someone has completed their medication, H. pylori has been eradicated or what would you advise? Okay, uh, criteria for H. pylori uh, eradication. Any patient uh, with an active H. pylori infection should be offered treatment. So, and this, 
any, as I said, any patient with an active H. pylori infection should be treated. Now, um, there are patients. Uh, there are patients who will receive uh, treatment for H. pylori, and uh, symptoms recur. But the first thing you still need to go back and ask: Did this patient comply to finishing the 14 days of the antibiotics, or rather the? the 14 days of treatment followed by a PPI. Then the other, as um, remember, uh, patients with uh, H. pylori will uh, present, uh, some present with non-specific uh, symptoms, abdominal, di abdominal discomfort. Uh, patients will also present with nausea. Some will present with vomiting. Some will uh, present with um, with burning sensation in the abdomen. Others will present with alarm signs of uh, weight loss, uh, bleeding. So uh, as we always say, you start with a good uh, history. Remember, you also need uh, to ensure, to, conf um, to confirm that this is, a, this is a, a, whatever is causing the symptoms is a H. pylori. Also confirm the patient is not all on uh, uh, NSAID uh, use, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. So once um, once a uh, treatment is uh, done, you can still do uh, if your diagnosis was uh, based uh, using a stool antigen test, which is what is commonly used. After treatment, after treatment, the test can be repeated. And if it is uh, negative, that means you've uh, you've uh, managed to eradicate uh, the bacteria. Now, in case uh, symptoms recur after treatment, uh, these uh, patients should be offered an opportunity to have an OGD done, and this uh, uh, OGD will also be important in looking for complications of uh, H. pylori. Um, thank you very much. Um, there's so many questions. It looks like this is a real topic of interest. So there's a question from Dr. Ann Wendwa, um, who's requesting whether you can comment on H. pylori in children. So um, its manifestations and the treatment regimens, are they the same ones that should in, in, that are used in adults that should be used in children? Uh, so, um, for, for, as I said earlier, uh, H. pylori is, uh, uh, is acquired uh, during childhood. And uh, what uh, the treatment uh, I went through was uh, a treatment for an adult population, because uh, most of what I see are adult uh, population. I would have to go and... Um, Check if it's the same if it's the same uh, treatment applies for children because I'm uh, I didn't go over the ch uh, children's uh, treatment. Um, thank you a lot um, for clarifying that, and I think that is something um, we can check and see um, the dosing um, levels and the type of treatment that is used in children. Um, there are several questions from the attendees um, who are requesting that you clarify the dosage of H. pylori treatment. So, Atari, please um, go over that. So, uh, for, our, for what we we'll call uh, our setup, for treatment in our setup, this will mean if you're using amoxicillin, uh, which is what we'll use, amoxicillin, clarithromycin, and, uh, and uh, PPI. So the most commonly available uh, PPIs will be omeprazole and also uh, esomeprazole. That is what uh, I see most of our patients. When you're using amoxicillin, we use it uh, one gram uh, twice, twice daily for, the, uh, for a duration of 14 days. And again, clarithromycin, we're going to use it at 500 uh, milligrams uh, 
uh, twice daily for the same duration of time. And uh, PPI, uh, for omeprazole, uh, we usually start at uh, 20 uh, milligrams uh, once daily, and also for uh, PPI, which is the S omeprazole. But remember the duration is for 14 days. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, there's a question here from an attendee in terms of when to start screening for um, the effects of H. pylori um, infection. So his, the anonymous attendee is asking, at what point do you stop doing the second line and the third line therapies and then now screen for its effects? All right. So remember, um, the at, uh, all uh, for patients with the uh, H pylori, remember you give them the first uh, the the first uh, the first line therapy, the standard first line therapy, and then uh, if a uh, symptom of uh, if uh, treatment fails, we go to the second line. Now remember, um, most of uh, like for example, in Kenyatta, you'll get uh, most patients are probably uh, received uh, the first uh, line treatment. So you can offer them, uh, but you can offer them second line treat, uh, second line uh, treatment. But uh, or rather, uh, yes. Then after that, if that fails, you need uh, to uh, send the patients for endoscopy. So the biopsy is taken for culture. Because um, once, uh, once the patient fails a second line, we need to do culture and sensitivity uh, for this bacteria. So yes, at what point do you screen uh, patients uh, for H. pylori? Uh, if you're looking for complications, these are patients who uh, who uh, who uh, otherwise have been treated for for tr uh, who have uh, symptoms and also have we, or what we co uh, we consider alarm sign. But you see, in that we are not uh, looking for you are not uh, looking for H pylori per se, but you're assessing for their complications of uh, H. Pylori. For example, if a patient presents uh, with uh, these symptoms, they are dyspeptic, the patient is probably um, 60 years old, and uh, they probably have uh, lung signs like weight loss, uh, weight loss. So that's a patient you want to screen for malignancy. Yeah, that's how I would answer that question. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tari, for your answers. Uh, maybe a few more questions. Um, there are several attendees who are asking whether there's a drug food interactor um, for in treatment of H. pylori and what should you recommend um, people with H. pylori infection to take? Uh, so, uh... Most uh, most uh, patients uh, most patients uh, with uh, what you call dyspepsia they'll present uh, with what um, uh, most of the, uh, most of them will tell you that uh, symptoms are worsened by taking um, different uh, foods. Uh, what I recommend for patients is that uh, uh, each individual is different. There, there's someone who will say, I will get, I get these symptoms uh, when I eat uh, kills. Then there's another one who will say, I get these symptoms when I eat uh, beans. And um, for that, uh, what I recommend uh, for patients that uh, wh whatever type of food is worsening the symptoms, I, rec I usually ask the patients to stop. But most of the patients are complain of acidic food, so you tell them to avoid citrus foods, oranges. Uh, you uh, tell them to avoid uh, pepper, 
uh, some, some complain of uh, black tea when they have the hyperacidity. Yeah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tani. Maybe a few more last questions. Uh, um, so there's a question here from Lawrence Zuki. Um, so in terms of recurrence of H. pylori, would you advise the patient to be given iron and vitamin B12 as prophylaxis, since these are effects of the disease? So would I recommend they get vitamin B12 and... and um... And iron prophylaxis. And iron prophylaxis. Uh, no. Uh, remember, as we were saying, it's not all patients who have, uh, um, it's not uh, all patients who will have, uh, who will have uh, vitamin B12 deficiency from uh, H. pylori. There are also other causes of, uh, of uh, vitamin B12. Similarly to patients who have uh, iron deficiency. So uh, what uh, if a patient has an unexplained uh, iron deficiency anemia, as in it's not, uh, this anemia is not from uh, blood loss per se. It, it's not from diet, as in you can't, you don't have a reason as to why this patient has iron deficiency anemia. For such a patient, I would screen for H. pylori and look for it. If I find it, then I will treat the patient. But as per prophylaxis for, uh, to give uh, all patients with H. pylori, vitamin B12 uh, and the iron supplements, no. Um, thank you very much um, for the answers to all the questions that have been asked. Um, we've addressed a majority of all the questions. And maybe I'd like to give you, Dr. Ari, um, a few moments to give you a parting shot about um, this disease. As you can see, it's a disease that um, even the attendees have asked so many questions about. It's a disease of interest. So what are your parting shots? So one, uh, H, uh, H. pylori, as you have said, it's not only a global problem, it's a problem with us. Uh, number two, we need to remember that uh, H. pylori for a large majority of the patients uh, is asymptomatic. But for those who are asymptomatic, who are symptomatic, it's associated with many gastric pathologies which we should always have in mind uh, when treating these patients. Remember, it can cause a uh, peptic ulcer disease. You can get gastritis. You can also get uh, tumors from H. pylori. Number three, you also need, uh, what you need to remember is that any patient with an active infection needs to be treated. This uh, will prevent a progression to complications. And uh, number four, there is treatment uh, for H. pylori. But what we need to always remember is uh, putting uh, in mind any time you're seeing a patient and you want to offer treatment, you need to first uh, find out have they been on other medications? Have they had a uh, treatment for H. pylori before? Before you give them a similar drug and now driving resistance. Resistance is also a problem. Uh, what we need uh, to remember is that uh, always have in mind that we have uh, metronidazole resistance where if you're able to try as much as possible not to give metronidazole for treatment of uh, H. pylori infection. Number two, uh, also have in mind that uh, we have uh, increasing resistance initially other studies uh, on resistance done did not report any clarithromycin resistance, but you have seen now we started noting a higher clarithromycin resistance. But in our setup, we still can use uh, clarithromycin since our resistance is up to 8%. But af af after, when you get to a resistance of 15%, 
that means you need to avoid the uh, clarithromycin and those will be my parting shots. Um, thank you very much, um, Dr. Ann Kabuzi, for your presentation today. And for sure, we've learned a lot um, about the H. pylori infection. And it, it's also good to learn that there's um, research that's out there about the common infections that are affecting us and discovery of resistance, which now is very important and informative in terms of how we manage our patients. Um, so this, the recording will be made uh, available on the KNH website for um, those who want to review um, this presentation again. Um, for anyone who has any issues with CPD points, kindly email us at knhcpd at gmail.com. Um, tomorrow we will be having a webinar on the introduction African Research Universities Alliance, Arua will come and give us uh, their presentations on non-communicable diseases, COVID and non-communicable multimorbidity. And it will be a very, very interesting discussion, which will be happening tomorrow from 2 to 3.30. So kindly join us even as we listen and deliberate. And for everyone who's out there, um, it's, it's now evident that um, uh, we, we should um, be involved in trying to figure out our problems and our solutions um, through research. And it will be a very good um, thing to hear more work that is being done. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.